please can you go wild for Rory? Oh yeah, I did a one-line one that I'm going to start off with. It's called, there's a human-animal hybrid operation going on and we're all not noticing it. Wake up, sheeple. <laughs> <laughs> This is an unfinished one that I decided to do anyway. It doesn't have a title, so it's just called The Stinger. Uh, this one's a quick little thing about fairy tales. So I'll go. Fairy tales. Even in a world gradually becoming ever more open and explicit in its content, fairy tales look to be the one constant, seemingly the final bastion of a certain kind of bizarre morality, where discussions that break young delusions about the world come forever, ever sooner. Death, sex, and drugs all becoming strange. Half their aspects of their lives where they know what they are, but they lack like anything beyond that. At that at the age where it's stuff that happens to other people. Not fairy tales, though. The wolf will always blow down the pig's houses rather than break through the straw and sticks and pull out the squealing pig by a bloodied ankle. Jack of the Beanstalk teaches us it's okay to break and enter into someone's house and steal their property if they're a bad person, and you kill them. <laughs> <laughs> the heron the tortoise teaches kids not to let their hubris get the better of them. Or, if you're going to pick on someone, make sure you've had a good night's sleep beforehand. <laughs> The Snow White does take you not, teach you not to take food from strangers. Well, the lies, the false hope they instill is probably worse than dodgy morals. Cinderella tells you that if you're an individual, you'll be noticed. Like, what? <laughs> uh, and also, I don't believe that she was the only person in the city with that foot size. And nowadays, if you had a slipper made of glass, that would not pass any health and safety regulations. <laughs> <laughs> and on a final note, if the spell wore off at midnight, why didn't that glass slipper disappear? Yeah, plot off. This one's about words, which helps because it contains words. This one's called We Always See Magazines and So On in a Supermarket, because I sometimes work at a supermarket. Uh, there's a lot of them. So, this one doesn't have a title either. It just goes, shock and horror. Representatives tell us in our expose of a decades-long abuse case, I don't know if the words banter and literally will ever be the same again. <laughs> Comma, the word like stole my job. Details were then. <laughs> Adjectives, we were forced into a haiku against our will. <laughs> the tells us exclusively, sonnets are so last century. Postmodern expressionism is the future. Interview, irony, why does nobody get me? <laughs> 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 uh, this is one I used uh, one of those online generators because uh, I mean who writes their own poetry these days um, and it came up with the subjects of trifle and pavlova so I thought yeah that's a good topic <laughs> called a peon to trifle I get on li with life as a student I have the usual hobbies I like collecting cards and watching films or watching cards and collecting films I have a lot of free time some days I like to contemplate trifle and it's custard filmed wi filmed Build, not films, those are very strange films. <laughs> Whipped cream and fruity sponge layered perfection. It's imperfect, perfect structure. But then I get daydreaming, and my mind turns up all to the pavlova. The chopped and soaked strawberries piece back together in deep reserve, and the sugar and cream solidify into an unforgiving white carapace. And that is truly terrible, for pavlova is by far the inferior dessert. While it may look like a wonderful strawberry anointed centerpiece, the taste is seldom as sweet, for strawberries are rarely in season, especially in England, except it. And it assaults your palate like a dessert that hates you. And I explain this to my classmates, but they're not listening. I like to use the words such as unparalleled and splendid. I like to use these words about trifle when discussing trifle with my close friends and immediate family. <laughs> How the trifle's construct is so made that it may give way to the incision of the serving spoon, that the structure may tumble and fall over as clothing whirls in the steel belly of your washing machine. Yet the flavours are designed to be eaten in any sort of order, and the sponge provides the dessert equivalent of a cartilage skeleton, flexible and yet retaining some semblance of shape. But when I stop talking, my mind subconsciously turns to Pavlova once more, and its solid, cloud-like form then crumbles to pieces upon contact with the spoon and becoming a chalky fog of diabetes, and the pieces get caught everywhere. I try to enlighten my friends on this important matter, but their interests lie elsewhere. 
I like to hang out with trifle. I often wear its formal dinner wear, with perhaps a dessert bowl as a hat. Really <laughs> <Georgie> <laughs> People often ask me why. Why am I coated in sponge and whipped cream? And the answer is very simple. It's a sherry trifle. <laughs> Instead of strawberries, tin peaches protrude from the alcohol-drenched sponge. Its swampy, semi-solid form will fit to any bowl with little trouble. Whereas pavlova, although it seems solid upon serving the sugary concrete shell, powderizes and crumbles into equally sugary shards that not only convert to saccharin syrup in one's mouth, but push the entire dish down the slippery slope that leads to the unenviable realms of the eaten mess. <laughs> and I do my best to explain this to my immediate family, and they reply, it was really good of you to come to the funeral. <laughs> <laughs> but can you please shut the fuck up about desserts? Your uncle's about to deliver the eulogy. <laughs>